You know, even after developers become experts in object-oriented programming in Java, they often remain uncomfortable with the concept of a constructor not being clear on exactly what a constructor does, or why it has the syntax that it has, or even why an overloaded set of constructors with multiple arguments might be necessary. Well, that's exactly what I want to demystify in this very quick tutorial. Hi, I'm Cameron McKenzie. I'm the editor-in-chief over at the server side.com and I have to be one of the world's biggest Java advocates. And one of the concepts that I always struggled with was constructors, which is why I put this tutorial together to teach you exactly what a constructor is, what it does, why we need them, and help you understand them. Starting off with a technical definition, a constructor is a mechanism in Java that allows you to create instances of objects and assign values to the various properties of those objects, potentially default values as well. Now, if you're new to Java or you're new to constructors, that technical definition probably doesn't help too much. So why don't we just step back just for a, a moment and first start off by thinking about exactly what a Java class is. And fundamentally, a class in Java is simply a way to organize data. That's all a Java class really is. I've got some code here where I've described two cars, right? And I haven't used classes. And as you can see, it's just a jumble of disorganized variables. Car one year equals 2002. Car one brand equals Dodge. Car two year equals 2001. Car two model equals Z3. Like it's just a bunch of variables floating around all over the place. And I can get my program to work like this, but it's not maintainable and it's not sustainable. So what do we do in Java? Well, we model this with an object or a class called car. I mean, you can see car jumping out from that code right there. So normally we'd create a class called car and we would add three properties, right? String brand, string model, string, oh, and then finally int year. So we've got three properties here. And now in our code, rather than having all of these scattered variables floating around, what we would do is we would say car c1 equals new car. And then we'd say c1 dot year equals 2002. c1 dot brand equals Dodge, right? That's a Dodge Viper that we're talking about here. Beautiful car. And then c1 dot model. We're talking about that V10 Viper right there. There we go. So now you can see that when we use objects here, that when we use Java classes and create instances of objects, it's a lot more organized and easier to read than a, a scattering of variables. You'll also notice that, well, when we actually use objects, we have to use that new keyword and then we call the constructor after that new keyword. New says create a brand new instance of an object in memory and the word that comes after the keyword new, the constructor, tells the Java virtual machine what type of object to create. And when it looks at what type of object to create, the Java virtual machine, the underpinnings of Java, is looking at that car class, looking at its properties, and it realizes that, well, it's got a property of type int and two properties of type string, so it's actually putting aside enough space and memory to hold that int and to hold those two string values. That's what the constructor's doing behind the scenes. It's really allocating memory. And so that C1 variable is really just a, a pointer to that space and memory where all of that data is held. Now, this method here that we've got, this constructor car, is referred to as the default constructor or the zero args constructor. And you might be wondering, where did that come from? Because if we actually look in that car class, you'll notice that there's no default constructor in there. Well, the default constructor comes for free. Java just assumes that if you create a class and you add some properties, you're gonna to wanna to create some instances of it. And if you're lazy, you don't have to create a special constructor of your own. It'll give you one automatically. And when it creates an instance of your object, it will initialize all of the objects to null and all of the primitive types to 
zero or whatever the default for the primitive type is. Um, and you can see, you know, right here, that's what we got. Car C1 equals new car. And then, you know, we actually went in and initialized all of those properties. If I actually went in here and said system.out.println c1.year, at the beginning, and as I run this code, the year would actually come back as zero, right? Because it's initialized to zero. If I said system.out.println c1.model and ran that code, you'd see that the model comes out as null. Now, after I've initialized those properties, so if I move those system out print lines a little further down, you'll actually see that it's all stuffed with really good data afterwards, 2002 and Viper. Now, the thing is, it's kind of messy to call the constructor and then initialize all of the different variables. Instead, it would be nice to, to say, hey, let's create a new car and it'll be a Dodge Viper and the year will be 2002. Now, right now, that causes an error because the only thing that's available to us is a default constructor, but you can actually see that that would look a lot nicer than you know, all of those initializations underneath, which is why we go in and create our own custom non-default constructors. So right now that code doesn't work, okay? That's what the, do you see the uh, red X there? If you do see the red X there, you need to get your eyes checked because that is a white X inside of a red circle. But uh, we'll talk about the problems with your eyesight a little bit later. So you can see that uh, this constructor for the car class works best if we get the brand, make, and year. So what makes sense is to, to come in here and create your own constructor. And the constructor is weird because it's kind of like a method, right? Um, it's got an access modifier doesn't have a return type. So methods normally have a return type. And also methods usually start with lowercase letters. This actually starts with an uppercase letter and it has to have the exact same name as the class. If it doesn't have the exact same name as a class, it's not a constructor. So a couple of weird things about the, the constructor there. Um, but here we said that the first property was going to be the brand, the second property was going to be the model, and the third property of type int was going to be the year. And I'll just use the, the first letter there. Uh, and that is now going to pass in uh, the data that was passed into the, the non-default constructor in that class, in that uh, main method, Dodge Viper in 2002. And I can just say, okay, well, the brand is equal to that variable b. The model is equal to that second parameter, which is m. And the year is equal to that third parameter, y. And now, when I run this code, I don't have to do the initializations afterwards like I did before, c1.year, c1. Now, that's all achieved through the non-default constructor. If I run my code, run as a Java application, you can now see that all of these values are getting initialized right off the bat from the non-default constructor that I created. So, I mean, it's nice, it's pretty, it's beautiful, it's elegant, and you know, it's certainly easier to read than all of these scatterings of different variables. Now, I will mention, I used uh, just the, the first letter of the variable name in the argument signature, string b, string m, int y. Because I wanted to make that obvious that, you know, b, m, and y is the data being passed into the method, and then brand, model, and year are properties of the class, right? It's just kind of uh, distinct there. Quite often, you'll see people not doing that. You'll <laughs> see string m, brand, model, and year here. And then obviously it's got to go brand, brand, model, model, and then year, year. And if you think that code looks confusing, uh, the compiler thinks that code looks confusing as well because it can't tell whether the brand is the data that's coming in uh, to the constructor externally or whether the brand is talking about the property. 
just to differentiate, you can say this dot brand, which means the property of the class equals brand, the value that's just passed in. This dot model, this dot year, and now you're saying take the instance variables property and set it equal to the value that comes in. Uh, by the way, the term for that is shadow variable. You've got two variables that are legitimate with the same name, but you don't know which one's which. Um, you've got shadow variables in there and it can be problematic. So um, either be careful with your naming or make sure you use the this keyword to indicate which of these properties is actually associated with the class. Okay, so now our code is getting a lot better. Um, now let's say we wanted to fix up this code at the bottom here. Instead of using that uh, non-default constructor, why don't we use the default constructor, right? So we can say car C2 equals new car, and then c2.year equals 2001. But, oh, hold on a second. We've got an error there. Hmm, the constructor car is undefined. <laughs> now, this is strange. It's actually saying that we can't use that constructor. We can't say car c2 equals new car and use the default zero argument constructor. I just used it two minutes ago. Like rewind and you'll see that we just did car C1 equals new car, C1 dot year C1. But right now, two minutes later, I can't use it anymore. So why is that? Well, the Java virtual machine says, look, if you create a class and the class doesn't have any constructors in it, we'll give you one, right? Here you go non-default constructor, we're generous, enjoy. But as soon as you create your own zero arg non-default constructor, as soon as you create your own constructor, the Java virtual machine says, oh, this person has uh, an idea on how they want this class to be used. Uh, the person wants to, to make sure that when people create instances of this class, certain properties are always initialized. Um, and, uh, and so the virtual machine says, look, if you don't create a constructor at all, we'll give you the default one. But as soon as you create your own, that default constructor is not available anymore. Um, unless somebody explicitly codes it, you have to use one of the constructors that are defined. And in this case, yeah, maybe it just doesn't make sense to have a car that doesn't have a year, doesn't have, uh, and the, the brand is null, and the model is null, right? That, that wouldn't be good for the application. So now we're forced to actually type in here, BMW comma Z3, Z3, um, and then 2001, something along those lines. Boys, this, this reminds me of, uh, I was in a Backstreet Boys video where they've got those three cars racing. Um, but now we've defined this second car, right? And we've used the non-default constructor again. And if I go in here and I actually run this code, run as a Java application, you'll see that the Java virtual machine and the Java code is keeping track of the two different objects. And it's also keeping track of the different properties as well. And I also think in the end, you can look at this code and you can just think that, yeah, this code is really a lot more elegant. It's a lot nicer to look at. The, the code is the code is a lot nicer to look at. It's a lot more elegant and it reads a lot better. Um, and it really is just uh, the proper way to create classes. You create your class, you add properties, and then you create meaningful constructors that allow your developers to appropriately initialize the properties when the class is created. So there you go. That's uh, the, the basics and the fundamentals of constructors in Java. Now, if you enjoyed this tutorial, why don't you head over to the serverside.com. I'm the editor-in-chief over there. We've got lots of great tutorials on Java, on Git, on DevOps, on Scrum, on Agile. If you're interested in me, you can always follow me on Twitter at CameronMCNZ. And I would recommend that uh, yeah, if you're on X or Twitter, um, 
send a tweet to me. I'd love to, to hear from you. I'd like to hear what you thought about this tutorial. Also, I've got a couple of books on Amazon, Hibernate Made Easy, Pickering is Springfield. I'm also working with a young freelancer, Darcy DeClute, who wrote the Scrum Master Certification Guide. So if you're into Agile or you know someone that's interested in Scrum Master Certification, that book's being used by a lot of people to score 100% on the certification exam. So check that out. Then finally, I do have a newsletter. I'm doing a lot of work with a new programming language named Mojo, which um, looks a lot like Java and it's poised to potentially replace Python in the AI and ML space. So I'm going to need a, a lot of Java developers to help me to teach static typing and Mojo to Python programmers. So if you're interested in AI, you're interested in ML, and you're interested in the future of software development, please sign up for that newsletter uh, and keep appraised of what's going on. It really behooves you to do so. Um, and finally, if you're watching this on YouTube, why don't you subscribe on YouTube?